What do you call one of these things? A phonograph? A turntable? Or a record player? Well, according to York's, the answer is yes. Have you ever come across a turntable which has the normal left and right RCA audio output plugs, but instead of a normal power cord which you plug into the wall, it has an unusual connector like this barrel plug? Or maybe the only thing coming out of it is a ribbon cable with a very weird connector like that. I refer to these as orphan turntables because the reason why they have those strange connectors is that they were originally designed to go together with a matching stereo system which they have since gotten separated from. I have two examples of them here both from the late 1980s, a York's Q100 and an Iowa PXE770. And there are a couple reasons why turntables like these can become orphans. First is that people may consider the turntable the only part of the stereo system worth buying. So somebody might have seen the complete system in a thrift store, but they didn't want the complete system. All they wanted was the turntable. So they bought just the turntable without the rest of the system, only to discover that they can't use the turntable just by itself. Or maybe on the opposite end, somebody had the complete stereo system, but they thought the turntable was the only part of it worth selling or giving away, and they just discarded the rest. But I think these two examples here may have been orphans from when they were new, because one thing you'll notice is that they both appear to be unused. They both still have their stylus protectors in place. This one has a sticker on it that you likely would have removed once you learned how to operate it. And this one still has a piece of tape holding the 45 adapter in place, which obviously someone would have removed if they had used it. And the reason why I think that happened is because by the late 1980s, vinyl records were declining in popularity so rapidly that the people buying the stereo systems these originally went with didn't want a turntable. So they didn't buy the matching turntable to go along with it, leaving retailers with an excess stock of these turntables. There's no demand for it. Nobody comes in and wants vinyl. What's happening is that in the battle between the old friend, that sometimes scratchy and fragile combination of stylus and vinyl, and the convenience and sonic splendor of the compact disc, the old friend takes a beating. In terms of being a cons mass consumer item, uh, the thing that 99.9% .9 of the population want to buy, I think this year will be the end of, uh, we'll see the end of the vinyl record. Or maybe someone did buy the complete system when it was new, but they had no interest in using the turntable, so they just kept it in its original packaging and put it in their closet or their attic where it stayed for 30 years until they discovered it recently. And they thought, hey, vinyl records are back now, so I'll try to sell this on eBay, which is where I found this in its original styrofoam packaging. And I'm sure the vinyl experts are going to chime in and say that neither of these turntables are worth saving or using. And they do have a point because by the late 1980s, regardless if they were built in or separate like these, the turntables that were included in inexpensive stereo systems were really more of an afterthought and did not include the highest quality components. Check this out. It's a box for a stereo system from the early 1990s, which points out every single one of its features, but the only thing they have to say about the turntable is that it has a dust cover. Yeah. But I'd hate to see these turntables go to waste after sitting unused for nearly 35 years. And if this Iowa turntable looks very similar to a new ATLP60X turntable, which now costs about $140, that's because it is very similar. This is basically the predecessor of the turntable design that became the ATLP60 and various other popular entry-level turntables. For example, even though it has the Iowa logo on it, this is actually an Audio-Technica AT3600L phono cartridge, which is one of the most popular kinds used on entry-level turntables today. So a turntable like this could be a perfectly viable option for a beginner if they're able to make it work with this weird connector. And I just pulled off this piece of tape that was holding the 45 adapter in place. The tape came off, but the adhesive stayed behind, so that shows you how long it's been sitting there. I actually paid more for the Yorks than the Iowa because I was intrigued by this big sticker proclaiming it to be a new space saver turntable. Plays full size LPs. Everything was getting smaller in the 1980s. Computers, 
video cameras, cassette players, but there's obviously a limit to how small you can make a turntable and still have it be able to play full-size records. So the trick they started using is that it can play a full-size record, but when you put it on the platter and close the lid, part of it is going to hang off the edge. And Yorks was not the only one to do this. Other companies like Sony and Kenwood had turntables of the same kind of design. And at first glance, the Yorks actually looks a bit more sophisticated than the Iowa because it has a replaceable standard half-inch mount phono cartridge and you can adjust alignment. Unlike on the Iowa where the phono cartridge is permanently attached and can't be replaced or adjusted. The Yorks turntable also has what looks like an adjustment for the tracking force. However, spoiler alert, appearances can be deceiving. Obviously, the easiest way to make an orphan turntable functional is to reunite it with the stereo system it originally went with. So, for example, if someone was selling the complete system, but you were only interested in the turntable, go back and get the rest of it. Or if someone gives you one of these, ask them if they have the rest of the system it came with. Even if they say it's broken, it may still be functional enough to serve as the power source and preamp for a turntable. As long as that part of it is working, it doesn't matter if the rest of the system is broken. But if you have to or want to just get the Orphan turntable working on its own, one like this, which has standard audio plugs on it, is going to be a lot easier. You just need to figure out a way to power it. And you may think you can just use a standard wall wart power supply, but notice the problem here? Yeah, that's not going to work. And besides, there's no sticker on this anywhere saying what kind of voltage it runs on, not even on the bottom. And that's very important to figure out. You don't want to put the wrong voltage in this and possibly burn out the motor. So since this is a Yorks turntable, I started looking on eBay for Yorks stereo systems that this may have originally come with. And first I found a Yorks model 2210 stereo system. And sure enough, it has a jack on the back for powering a turntable, which looks like it uses the same connector. And it says DC 12 volts, 70 milliamps maximum. So now we know the correct voltage. But there's one thing it doesn't say, and that is the polarity of that DC power output jack. I know these days people assume that anything that runs on 12 volts DC and uses a barrel plug like that is going to be center positive, which is what this diagram is indicating. And these days, center positive is the norm, but especially back in the 80s and early 90s, you definitely could not assume that because a lot of equipment used center negative. For example, Sega video game consoles like the Master System, Genesis, and Mega Drive all used center negative. Casio musical keyboards are center negative, even though they don't give any indication of it. And most portable cassette tape recorders use a center negative power jack, as this one indicates. So I kept looking on eBay and I found another York stereo system with the same kind of DC output jack on the back for the turntable. This one is the York's model 2320A. And sure enough, when I look on the back, it says phono DC out 12 volts, 0.1 amps. And it shows the diagram indicating it's center negative. So I could just chop off this plug on the turntable and then take this DC 12 volt power supply, chop off its plug and wire them together. But in case I ever come across one of those matching York stereo systems, I wanted to preserve the originality of this turntable. So that made me look for a pre-made plug-and-play solution for getting this to work. But before we go down that route, what if you can't find any information about the voltage and polarity the turntable runs on? Then you're going to have to open it up and look at the circuitry inside, which on a turntable like this is really just going to be a motor and a switch. And interestingly, I can see three sets of holes marked 33 and 45. So this clearly was designed to accommodate several different mechanisms. And I have seen these Yorks turntables with different mechanisms, one of which looks nearly identical to the kind used today on suitcase-style record players from brands like Crosley and Victrola. So this was really the ancestor of that kind of design. I find them really easy to identify. I mean, just look at that. If you see that in the top of something, I would suggest running a mile uh, away from it. But I'm going to unscrew and remove this bottom cover. There's several screws around the outer edge. I can hear a snapping sound when loosening these screws, so clearly this has never been opened before. I think that should be it, so let's try to 
remove this cover and there it is just as simple as I thought this is the power going in as a switch on the turntable which is part of the auto stop mechanism it shuts off the motor when the tone arm gets to the middle of the record here's the motor itself a speed selector switch for 33 and 45 and two LEDs which tell you which speed it's running at and over here is where the audio cables connect to and that just goes directly into the tone arm so there's no built-in preamp or anything on this and we can see the wire with the stripe on it going into the auto stop switch and when it leaves the switch it becomes a red wire which means this is the positive lead now we just have to figure out whether the wire of the stripe on it is connected to the center or to the outer shell of the barrel plug obviously I already know this is going to be the outer one because this is a center negative plug but I just want to confirm it so I have my multimeter here set to the continuity position so if it's making continuity it's going to beep and I think I can just about stick the probe in here and get it to make contact with the switch so now I just need to test which part of this barrel connector is connected to this positive wire so let's try the middle no beep now the outer shell we get a beep so this is center negative outer positive and while we're in here these are the trimmers for adjusting the speed it's built into the circuit board that goes to the switch it's marked 33 and 45 so you can just stick in a small screwdriver and adjust those trimmers if you need to adjust the speed there we can see the motor itself it was made by Machusta Electric in other words Panasonic and it was actually made in 1985 so it's a little bit older than I thought unfortunately so far there's no indication of who designed this mechanism maybe I'll see something when I remove the platter I want to get in here anyway to check the condition of the belt and see if it needs to be replaced so as typical there's a little clip on the center here that you need to pry off to be able to remove the platter so there it is luckily it didn't go flying so now we should be able to just pull up on the platter okay a little bit of prying from both ends got it loose so now I should be able to just pull it up and the belt will come off so the belt may be a little bit stretched out but otherwise it looks okay it still has its elasticity and otherwise extremely simple in here just a center spindle the motor and this is part of that auto stop mechanism I'll show you how this mechanism works because it's rather unusual and it's not immediately obvious about how to work this thing that's the reason why they put this sticker here saying note to start operation lift tone arm from the rest and pull tone arm to the right until the click is heard so normally on a record player to get it spinning you just move it on top of the record and it automatically starts spinning the platter but this one if you do that nothing happens that's because you have to pull it the other way so you hear that click that switches on the motor now you can play the record until it gets to the middle you'll see it start moving that mechanism there and eventually it'll trigger the auto stop I think it does that better when you're actually playing a record than when you're trying to move it by hand here but that triggered the auto stop so that shuts off the platter it doesn't lift up the tone arm and bring it back you have to do that by hand but it will shut off the motor at the end of the record and to reinstall the belt you put it around this center part of the platter and stretch it out onto this peg and then when you put it down that stretched out part is right here you put that down on top of the motor so it goes like that and then you rotate it to hear it pop the belt off of that peg and onto the motor now I can put that clip back on the center spindle Okay, it's on so as mentioned I could just cut off this plug cut off the plug of my 12 volt DC power source wire it together and I would have a working turntable but I don't want to do anything destructive to this turntable so I'm going to use a couple different products to make this work without cutting anything 
The first is this 12 volt 5.5 millimeter by 2.1 millimeter DC ellipsis able wire ends plug barrel. That doesn't make much sense, but what it is is a coupler. It takes the plug and converts it into a socket. So you would think I could just plug in my power here and we'd be good to go. But remember, this is center negative, not center positive. So what we need is one of these. It's from Mr. Power. It's a reverse pole ellipsis effect pedal one pieces. What they cut off there is reverse polarity. And this is converting it from center negative to center positive. So if I plug this in here, finally we have a socket that can accept 12 volts DC center positive from any standard 12 volt DC power source. And now we have a functional turntable with no cutting of the wires. And right now I'm actually powering this with a battery pack. This has eight AA batteries in it. So it supplies 12 volts DC. So I can open the lid, put it on my record, swing the tone arm to the right, and it starts to rotate, and I can play my record. Don't have it connected to any speakers right now, but at the end of the record, when it reaches the lead out groove, it stops. Now we've got the power source all sorted and the turntable is spinning away merrily, but what about the audio? You may think we can just connect this to any phono preamp and we'd be good to go. But remember what I said about appearances can be deceiving. First of all, what may look like a knob for adjusting the tracking force is just a decoration. It does not use a counterweight. Instead, it actually uses a cap. Why is that so fast? It does not have a counterweight. Instead, it actually uses a spring to act as a counterbalance. And more importantly, this is not a magnetic phono cartridge. It's a Chuo Denshi CZ680 ceramic phono cartridge, which will not work with a standard phono preamp. If you connect a ceramic cartridge to a phono preamp designed for a magnetic cartridge, you'll get a very distorted sound. And if you connect it to a standard line level input, it'll sound very tinny. So you really need a special phono input designed for a ceramic cartridge. And therein lies the problem, because we're trying to use this orphan turntable without the cheap 1980s stereo system it was originally sold with. And what is the cheapest and most readily available device that has a ceramic phono input? A cheap 1980s stereo system. Since this is a standard half-inch mount cartridge, I could actually replace this ceramic cartridge with a magnetic cartridge and then adjust that spring to the correct tracking force for it. But I think that would be an example of the sunk cost fallacy because by the time you buy a turntable like this and then buy all these adapters so you can connect it to a standard 12 volt power source and then upgrade it to a magnetic phono cartridge and add a preamp for it. Well, with all that time and expense spent on making this turntable usable, you could just get a turntable that has a magnetic cartridge and a built-in preamp that you can just plug in and use, like a used ATLP60. I think those things sell for around $50 to $60, which is what you would end up spending on this trying to achieve the same thing. And that's really not worth spending on such a cheap low-end turntable, even if it is nice and small and cute. Nonetheless, since I've already gotten this far, I'll give you a brief sample of what this turntable sounds like with a stereo system very similar to the one it originally would have come with. Except this is a sound design instead of a Yorks, but they were very similar cheap low-end brands of the 1980s. Command records are recorded wide range from 10 cycles to well beyond 15,000 cycles. Our recording characteristics are, in addition, based on RIAA standards. And your compensation or tone control should be set to the RIAA point as indicated on your preamplifier for the following tests. Quite appealing 
that no one can dispute and I'm cute to boot I'm newt the flute You can also use it with a cheap 1970s stereo system Obviously the styling doesn't match but I think you'll agree with me that the sound quality is actually a lot better. Ladies and gentlemen, Ronnie Gaylord and Bert Holiday, the Gaylords. All of my love, all my kissing, you don't know what you've been missing, oh boy. But I'm with you, oh boy. The world can see that you oh man. Let's move on to the turntable that probably is worth saving if we can figure out how to adapt it to this connector. This is where it comes in handy to be an electronics hoarder and constantly acquiring parts just in case you might need them someday. So I got this pack of 20 pin jumper wires which is way more than what we need but we'll use some of this. And just recently I came across this bag of random car stereo wiring and it has RCA cables that go to wires that we can cut off and wire to this and that will be our solution for connecting this to an audio amplifier if we can figure out the pinout of this connector. Well unfortunately I think this is where I will need to do a destructive modification and just cut off this plug and strip it down to bare wires because I tried using some of that ribbon wire. My plan was to get five of these pin sockets and just plug it directly into the pins of this connector. But when I do that, it just doesn't hold tightly enough to make a good connection. It just slips right off because I think those little pins in there are smaller diameter than what these were designed to accept. So it's just not a good solution and I don't have anything smaller that would fit on those pins so I'll just need to cut off this plug strip it down to bare wires and then I can use this audio cable that I got from that bag of car radio wiring I strip the ends of that down to bare wire so that'll be ready to attach to this once I figure out which wires go where I also got this barrel jack the same kind that can fit onto our 12 volt DC power supply because this is almost guaranteed to use another 12 volt DC motor just like that York's turntable so this will be my solution for the power strip that down to bare wire so I can just connect that to the relevant wires of this connector this has got to be 12 volts DC and ground for the motor and left right and common ground for the audio that's pretty much the universal kind of pinout it uses on these. You just need to figure out which one is which. After reluctantly cutting off the end of this cable and stripping the wires, that's what I've got. I saved enough of the wire on this connector so if I ever did have a use for it I could connect it back together. And once again I did some searching online and I actually found the service manual for the stereo system that this Iowa turntable originally came with. And sure enough in the schematic it shows the pinout for the phono connector. Pin 1 is the left channel, pin 2 is the ground, pin 3 is the right channel, pin 4 is the motor ground, and pin 5 is 12 volts DC for the motor. So now I just need to figure out 
which end of this is pin 1. This side has a stripe on it, which you could assume that side has pin 1 on it, but just like assuming that these barrel plugs are all center positive, that's not always right. So once again, I'm going to open up this turntable and trace out the wiring so we can know for sure. This time there's only one set of holes for the speed adjustment trimmers. And with this amount of circuitry here, this might actually have a built-in preamp, which I did not expect. But here are those speed adjustment trimmers, which are separate from the motor. There is the motor itself, the speed selector switch. And if you've ever seen the inside of an ATLP60 or similar turntable, you recognize these metal rods going to the mechanism. It shows the date as 76, but that's not 1976. That's year 76 of the traditional Republic of China calendar, which is used in Taiwan. But we don't need to look up what that's equivalent to in the Western calendar, because right here on the plastic molding, it shows it was made in 1987. And it's upside down and almost hidden by the wiring, but this also uses a Machusta motor, and it has a date of May 1987. And as for the pinout of the cable, Iowa made it easy for us because it's listed right here on the board. You can see left, and then it's blank, which is the ground for the audio, which is that striped wire. Then right, then ground for the motor, and B. I assume that means like B plus for the motor. And the side of the stripe is pin 1. And Iowa probably did sell this as a standalone turntable because here's where the power transformer would have gone. There's the notch where the power cord would go out. And there's the notch where the audio cable would go out and connect to the built-in preamp. After doing some quick and dirty wiring, I have my 12-volt DC power input jack, center positive, and my left and right line level audio outputs. Listen now to Enjoy Yourself. So this has been a look at two orphan turntables and how you can get them working again without the stereo system they are originally meant to go with and why you probably shouldn't. Because these kinds of turntables were the low end of the market when vinyl records were rapidly falling out of favor with the general public. So they used the cheapest possible components and they were just not very good quality to begin with. And today, 35 plus years later, they're probably not worth your time unless you can reunite them with the stereo systems they were originally meant to go with.